I appreciate you dropping by for my midweek Bible study. And it's Wednesday, the 25th of January, 2024. And I can't figure out what happened in 1967. But that's but that's because I'm 75 years old and I was, I'm not 18 anymore. Well, we're going to look at Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Some powerful stuff, an important concept. And uh, I call this repent or perish. Repent or perish. Tough, tough lesson. But you know what? It's the truth. So we need to proclaim it, stand on it, and call people to it. And uh, what is my channel about? It's Christian Ministry Central. On Mondays and Fridays, I have a sermon, okay? Mondays, we're going through the Gospel of Mark. We're finishing up 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John on Fridays. I think I'm going to jump into some uh, some other stuff from the Gospel of John. There's nine um, nine signs in the Gospel of of uh, John. I think I'm going to jump on those next. Do nine messages from that from that, and I'm going to wander into some other stuff. We're, it's always going to be exposing the truth of the Bible. You know, that's what I'm always about. And then on Wednesday, the Bible study, and I do different things on Wednesdays. And then every day I do my <clears throat> daily devotions, the Bible reading I've been doing for many years. I, it's evolved over the I've been reading the Bible every day for 52 years. The, the times that I miss doing that are been like I, I, in 2014, I had brain surgery and hearts, open heart surgery, and I missed a few days in those times. But other than that, I read the Bible and pray every day. I call it my devotion time or my quiet time, I used to call it, but it, I'm calling it the daily devotions for this. And I read that with you every day. Every day I'll do probably six short Bible thoughts, shorts. And if you have a prayer need, you put it down in the comments. I'll pick up on it and I'll do a, minute, a less than a minute prayer video and I'll get a hundreds of people praying for you, okay? Uh, this is Christian Ministry Central. I want to create ministry by teaching the Bible and creating prayer opportunities for people. And it changed lives. That's what it's about. I want to see people come to Jesus and have lives changed. Let's take a minute and pray, and we're going to jump into Luke 13, 1 through 9. Repent or perish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would address our lives today. Address me in this, in this passage, God. And I pray that you'd call us all to your standard, Father. Uh, through the passage that we look at today. Make a difference in our lives because you've spoken. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 30 years ago, in 1994, there was an earthquake centered in Northridge, California. It registered 6.7 on the Richter scale. You may, may remember that in the news if you're old like I am. I, I think initially 57 people died. Later studies said that it was a total of 72 that died, counting heart attacks that were caused by the earthquake. Got people all, shall we say, shook up, and they had a heart attack, and they passed away. It all happened January 17th, 1994, at 4.31 a.m. Thousands of people were injured, and <clears throat> the this, this 72 people passed away because of the earthquake. So here's the question. Do you think God's judgment was being poured out on these people 30 years ago? Do you think that's what happened? When bad things happen and sometimes horrible things happen and millions of people sometimes are killed, do you think it's the judgment of God coming on them all the time? The passage we're going to look at today addresses that kind of concept and gives us a profound message from, from the mouth of Jesus himself. Luke 13 one through three to start. <clears throat> now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Okay, he's talking about some Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. What's he talking about? Well, 
probably impossible to identify the exact event that's being referenced. Would have been in there, would have been known to them in that day. It's been lost in history somewhere. We know, though, that Galilee was prone to rebel against Roman rule. They hated Roman rule, the Jews did. And Galilee was an area that was really prone to rebel against Roman rule. And it sounds from this passage like some people from Galilee were worshiping and sacrificing to the Lord under the Jewish legal system. And for whatever reason, were killed by Pilate, who was the Roman prefect, they called him, in that area in those days. It is possible that they could have been revolting or protesting, that there was a lot of that because uh, Galilee was a place that was prone to revolt and protest. But at any rate, Pilate mixed their blood with their sacrifice. You're left with the impression that they were doing Jewish worship and somehow or another got killed by Pilate, who was a complete rascal. So the impression is left that they were killed by Pilate and he mixed their blood with their sacrifices, which would have been their worship. So were, were they worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered like this? Does that mean that they were worse sinners and God was getting them back kind of a thing? Is that, is that what's going on? Look at verse 3 again. Jesus answers that question. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you, will too, you too will all perish. He says, no, they weren't worse sinners than other people. Uh, they weren't worse sinners than other Galileans. The point, their disaster was not punishment for some sin or shortcoming from God. God wasn't getting them because of something they did wrong. Often people assume that when someone is killed or some bad thing happens to someone, maybe someone dies young or they're killed in an accident or they come up with cancer young or whatever, that God's punishing them. That is never, that is not always the case. Most of the time, it's not the case. Jesus said simply, I tell you, no, no. God doesn't necessarily dump on people for sin or mistakes in this life. Now, there's Sometimes they were in the wrong activity at the wrong time or in the wrong place, and the result was great harm came to them. The natural consequence of doing the wrong thing sneaks up on you sometime. You know, it's like I, I uh, smarted off one night when I, I probably 17, 18 years old, smarted off one night to some guys in a parking lot. They'd been drinking. I, I did a bunch of stupid stuff when I was young. They'd been drinking, I'd been drinking, I smarted off at them, and next thing you know, six of them jumped me, and I got all beat up, you know? That's just the natural consequence of stupid stuff that happens, okay? But it's not the judgment of God. It's just the natural consequence. For instance, you know, a guy could be drinking beer in the street with his buddies, like I was that night, and to get into a fight with a rival bunch of guys, get beat up. That's the natural consequence of stupid activity. But it's not necessarily the judgment of God. But the 72 people killed in the 1994 earthquake were not under God's judgment. That's, what Je that's the kind of thing that Jesus was addressing. Now, look at Luke 13, 4 and 5. We're going to take it a step further. Luke 13, 4 and 5. Or, he brings up another incident, or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. What about the 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on people? It must have been, there was a pool called Siloam, a pretty famous pool. It appears that there must have been a tower somewhere in that vicinity. It had to, had to be close as a part probably of the, uh, of the temple. And the Tower of Siloam fell on 18 people and killed them. And that was in, they knew about that in their day. We, it's again, lost to our history, except this reference to it in the Bible. So it was a, a current news item for them, which most, most, most of the time that would have been, you know, word of mouth, maybe sometime between 80, 30, and 33. But it's unknown to us exactly what happened. So the question is this. Were the 18 people killed in that incident when the, the, the Tower of Siloam fell on them, 
were they more guilty than the other people living in Jerusalem? That's a good question. And he answers it very directly and straight up in, in verse 5, okay? I tell you no, but unless you <laughs> repent, you too will all perish, okay? No, they weren't worse sinners than the other people. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the tower fell on them. They got killed. But it's they were not being punished for guilt in their lives, you know? Now, they weren't more sinful, just like the 72 people at the North Ridge quake were not more sinful. God wasn't getting them. Bad stuff happens sometimes. That's the point. Some people get sick and die. Some really good people get sick and die. I, uh, for, but it doesn't. it's not God's punishment. Just bad stuff happens. For instance, my little sister, godly, served the Lord her whole life, got cancer and died at 48. I ended up doing her funeral. Tough time for me, you know. But she, she wasn't being punished. In fact, she won because she went to heaven, you know. That's how you have to look at that. And it because it's the truth, okay. So God's not dumping on people. So what is the teaching point that Jesus is making? That's the big thing. What's the teaching point? The teaching point is in verse 3 and verse 5. He repeats it, okay. Verse 3. He says, I tell you no, but unless you, re you too, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Okay. He says it again in verse five. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. He, he is telling them, it's the teaching point. If we don't repent, we're going to perish just as certainly as the folks in Galilee or the folks that the Tower of Siloam fell on, perished, or as certainly as the folks in the North Northridge earthquake, earthquake perished. He said, unless you repent, you're going to perish just like those folks did. That's his teaching point. He is teaching about repentance. The point is repent or perish. Now, repent is a, is a big concept. It's an important concept. What does it mean to repent? What are we talking about? It is to change, to, the word repent means to change your mind and change the direction of your life. You do, you change your mind and change your direction. You're going down your own road, doing things your own way, maybe deeply sinful, and you're headed toward destruction. You change your mind. You so, say, you know what, I'm going to start doing things God's way. I went through that big time, at, right, at, between, right at the time I was turning 23 years of age. And you say, you know what? I'm going to do life God's way. So I'm going to, I'm going with him, not me anymore. I'm going to quit doing things my way and I'm going to start doing things God's way. You change your mind, change your direction. Think of it as an about face. You know, kind of goes back to being in the army. I do an about face. You change your mind and change the direction of your life. That's, that's to repent. Uh, for me, uh, <clears throat> I had been big time into party time. I was supposed to be a Christian, you know, and I was, but I was an unrepentant Christian. And I finally reached a point where I said, you know what? I, uh, it was a, 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 um, in the middle of the night in 1972, right? January 72, right after I got out of the army. And um, so it's 2024 right now. So this would be 52 years ago this month. Uh, I said, you know what? I I have not done too well running my own life. And I've been reading the Bible and praying and reading a book by Billy Graham. I've told this story over and over again. And I finally said, you know what? I, I, I need to sell out to Jesus as Lord. That's the first night I was introduced to the fact that he's called Lord 200 times more and he's called Jesus in the New Testament. I go, I think I'm getting the, I'm getting the idea here. He's supposed to be running my life, not me. I'm supposed to surrender to him. So I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I'm, I have not been doing too good running my own life, so I'm turning it over to you. I changed my mind and I changed the direction of my life. I repented. That's when things change for us. And I did the about face. Now, there's <clears throat> when you repent, you're, you're not going to be judged for your deeds. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 
through 15 talks about that. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. I'm going to walk you through those verses. They're, they're very, very important. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. God sitting on his throne is going to judge. That's what's going on. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. You wouldn't want to have your deeds written in the books. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Listen to this. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The dead are those who have not repented, okay? The dead are judged according to what their deeds, which are recorded in the book. Think about this. All the dumb stuff we've done in our life is recorded in a book in heaven unless we've repented, which really means convert in a lot of ways. If we've repented, then our book is in the Lamb's book of life, not our deeds recorded in the other books. Because if our deeds are recorded in the other books, we're judged by them, okay? The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. He's talking about the people who had not repented. They hadn't converted to Christ. Their deeds were written in the books. Their name was not in the book of life. Those who have repented, their names are in the book of life. But the others, their names are not in the book of life. Their deeds are recorded in the books. And they're judged by their deeds, not by what Jesus paid for them at the cross. When you repent, your judgment was paid for by Jesus and what he paid at the cross, okay? Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That means the folks whose names were not in the book of life, but were, their deeds were recorded in the other books. They are death and Hades. And they're thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. They experience the second death, which is the judgment of God that Jesus is talking about. It's not going to go well for them. It's not going to be fun. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, being judged by his deeds. Why? He hadn't repented. And what Jesus is saying in the text we looked at today, he's saying, repent or perish. That's what he's talking about in Revelation chapter 20. Repent, get your name in the book of life, be under what Jesus paid for you at the cross. If not, you'll perish. You'll end up in the lake of fire. Repent, get your name in the book of life, or you'll be judged guilty by the deeds recorded in the other books. And But if you do repent, then you're, you will not end, end up in the lake of fire. You're in, you'll end up in heaven for eternity in the presence of God, rejoicing in the presence of God. Now, there's more to Jesus' story. Luke 13, 6 through 9. I'm going to go back to the 13th chapter of Luke. Luke 13, 6 through 9. Then he told this parable. Decided he'd drop a parable on him, okay? A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any, Okay? So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Why it's not being fruitful, okay? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I call this an extra year of grace, an extra year of grace. A guy planted a vineyard and there's no fruit on the fig on a fig tree for three years running. He kept checking the fig tree to see if there is fruit on it. And he said, I find no fruit on this tree, cut it down, okay? It, now I, I Googled how long it takes for a fig tree to bear fruit if you plant it like a seedling. It takes three to five years for a new fig tree to bear fruit. Uh, and the owner wants fruit. Okay, the owner's God, okay? The fig tree's us, and he wants us to be fruit bearers, okay? The caretaker says, listen, 
I'll fertilize it and take care of it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. The owner says, okay, we'll do that. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut the tree down. It is fruitless. God wants us to be fruitful. So how does cutting the fruitless tree relate to repentance? Okay. Repentance sets the stage for fruit bearing. When you repent, you really convert and you come under the Lordship of Christ and let him rule your life. Then not only do you not perish, but then you become fruitful. Matthew chapter three, verse eight talks about that. John the Baptist brought that up when he was preaching. And uh, Matthew chapter three, verse eight, listen to this, this is important. I'm going to read verse 7 with it. All these Pharisees are coming to John the Baptist to be baptized, you know. And it was a baptism of repentance. They were stating that they were, hey, you know what? I've been doing it wrong. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to change my mind and change the direction of my life. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, <laughs> he didn't mix any words, old John. He said, you brood of vipers. That's like saying you bunch of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Then he says this, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What's he saying? He's saying, look, if you've really repented, you're going to bear, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to be different than you were before. You're going to bear fruit for God. You're not going to keep doing the same stupid stuff you did before. You're going to be fruitful and bear fruit for God. God wants us bearing fruit. Repentance sets the stage for fruit bearing. It brings God into our life. It brings his involvement into our life. And then we begin to bear fruit for him. So how does the year of grace work? Here's, here's what I believe he's talking about. He, he's, you know, as long as we're living, okay, as long as I'm drawing breath, then I believe that I'm in the year of grace. Once you pass from this life, the year of grace is over. The year of grace is what the what the uh, <clears throat> the the guy who was taking care of the tree was talking about when he said, "You know, I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to take care of it. See see if I can get it to bear fruit." And the Lord, the owner said, "You know, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it another year. See if it'll bear fruit." I think we're getting that other year as long as we're living, and we have an opportunity to decide to bear fruit, to be fruitful by repenting and getting God involved in our life. See, repentance gets the Lord involved in your life, and then you begin to bear fruit for repentance. So how long do we have? Only God knows, because you have as long as you'll live. And we and, and listen, I've been doing funerals for people for about 50 years. I've been doing three, four, five funerals a month lately, because I work at a funeral home. I end up doing funerals for people. But let me tell you, you might, you might live, I did a funeral for a 28 day old baby this year. Painful, hurts, you know, and I've done funeral for people in their nineties. So how long are you going to live? You don't know. The only person who knows that is God. So how long do we have to live? Only God knows. What's the point? Repent now. Repent now and get on with the fruit bearing. That's what God wants to do with your life and my life. I always think of Acts 2.38 when it comes to repentance. Because, you know, I'll tell you why. I was, uh, I pastored in an independent Christian church or Church of Christ for 30 years. And that's still kind of, I'm ordained in that kind of a church. And <clears throat> we're big on Acts 2.38, okay? Because it talks about baptism. We're, we're immersionists. Okay, but you know what? what? What often gets missed, that's not the only thing Acts 2.38 talks about. They asked, the folks asked what they needed to do about the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, okay? In verse 38, Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just tell them to get baptized, told them to repent. Telling them to convert to Christ, you can't do that without repenting, okay? You can go get stuck in the water every day for the rest of your life, but if you haven't been repented, if you haven't repented, it's just a bath, 
okay? Repentance is required for baptism to take effect. You repent, you turn your life around, you turn it over to the Lord, and you're baptized, which is experiencing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ with him, okay, in the, in the waters of baptism. And what you're doing is you're saying, you know, Lord, I've repented. I've turned my life over to you, and I'm stating that I trust your death, burial, and resurrection to save me. You've converted. Guess what happens then? Repentance really kicks in, okay? You've converted to Christ. And when that happens, guess what happens? You start bearing fruit for God. It's impossible not to, which is the point. Repentance or conversion will lead to God being involved in your life. And it will lead to you bearing fruit for God. So the message, repent or perish. world needs to hear that. The world needs to hear that. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us live it. And I pray that people all around the country and all around the world would come to Jesus, repent, and be baptized into him, and convert and let him get involved in their life and be fruitful. I cry out to you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.